Hello, and welcome to the internet. My name is Mochi, and I like to read. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> My New Year's resolution this year was to read more nonfiction books than I did last year, which should not be difficult because I didn't read any nonfiction last year. But before going forward with what I want to share with you today, I have something to confess. It's something that I'm kind of, I've been embarrassed about my whole life, but I'm done. I'm done with the shame and I'm, I'm letting go. I have always gotten confused between nonfiction and fiction. I've always gotten them confused. Don't ask me why from when I was a kid to like present day, I have had a problem with fiction and nonfiction. Okay? To the point where I've had to create a mnemonic device. Is that how you use the word mnemonic? Is it mnemonic? I'm not gonna look it up. To the point where I had to create a mnemonic device to remember fiction, F, is for fake, and nonfiction, NF, is not fake, or colloquially referred to as real. That being said, I found a list. I thought, you know, I'm in a bit of a reading slump and I need a list of nonfiction written by celebrities because maybe if they're interesting enough, I'll actually read them. So I found this list and I was looking through this specific list that I found. I'll put it up on the screen. I was blown away by some of the names on this list for what I thought was nonfiction. I mean, 50 Cent, Lorelai from the Gilmore Girls, Snooki. I thought I was golden. I was gonna I was gonna read so many interesting stories. But then I looked back at the title of the article and I saw that it was fiction books. These celebrities, they were not talking about the real. These celebrities were writing about the fake. And just like that, all of my plans went out the window. I mean I looked back at the list, 50 Cent, Lorelei, Snooky. These people have written novels. Tyra Banks wrote a novel, according to this article, and she describes it as Hunger Games meets Harry Potter meets Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory meets America's Next Top Model. At this point, we're just saying words, and I don't know how you expect me to read this list and not be incredibly confused, but also intrigued at the same time. And you might be thinking, Mo, calm down. You're freaking out over nothing. These celebrities probably didn't even write these books. They probably used a ghostwriter and just slapped their name on the front to take credit for it. You know, ghostwriters are so taboo, and no one would really admit to using them. That is a very specific point that you've made, but that's exactly what I thought. And then I found out that ghostwriters, uh, I mean, at least the ones that are being paid by celebrities, <laughs> they're chilling. They love it. The ghostwriter is getting paid copious amounts of money to write a book for a celebrity. The celebrity puts their name on it. The ghostwriter gets lots of money and anonymity, which sounds like the dopest gig <laughs> in the world. From what I can gather, gone are the days of Zoella, a YouTuber getting canceled for putting out a novel and saying she wrote it, but actually having a ghostwriter. 2014 is a different universe. Now, people are openly stating that they're working with ghostwriters and that they're working together or collaborating, which just for sure, dude. These fiction books really come in a couple of different categories. There's children's books, picture books, coffee table books, YA novels, and my favorite new thing from this list, which is reality TV stars who write a book about a person becoming a reality TV star, but then insisting that nothing in the book is based in real life, which I wasn't going to accuse you of before you said that, but rest assured, it's all I'm thinking about now. So with all of my plans thrown out the window. I now had free time to read one of these books instead. A lot of them seemed like a lot. I'm looking at you, Tyra. I did get Kendall and Kylie's novel. Kendall and Kylie wrote a novel, by the way, which I'm sure is just so good. Uh, but ultimately, I don't think I could actually enjoy that. So I went with Elixir, written by Hilary Duff and a her collaborator, Elise Allen, and I am so glad I did. It was everything that I thought it was gonna be and more. But let me take you through the plots before I take you through my point. Main character, name, 
Clea, age 17, that matters. Mom, a senator. Dad, dead. Hobbies, photography. Clea is in Paris with a friend who's also 17 and instead of going out partying and hooking up with a guy or something, she goes back to her hotel room to look at all the photos that she's taken as she's been on this trip that I mentioned. She's a photographer. She takes the photos. She's looking at the photos. She's scrolling through the photos on the computer and she notices a face in every single photo of a mystery man. Clea thinks that she's being stalked. She starts to freak out, but then she takes a photo of like the room she's in and Homie's face is in that photo too. So she's really freaked out. We don't have a whole lot of time to think about it because a fire happens and a building burns down. No one's hurt. It's not important to the plot. I'm mentioning it anyway. Hope you didn't care too much about Paris because we're back in New York and Clea is meeting with her friend Ben who is notably a 20 year old adult man. Ben is very obviously only in the book so that Clea has a love interest. He's supposed to be like a bodyguard but he's not very physically intimidating and he's like really smart and he used to also work with her dad who's now dead did I mention? So I guess he's just like supposed to keep her safe with his intellect? I don't know but Ben tells her that she got a job offer to do photojournalism work for Carnaval in Brazil. Now she wants to do that because it's Carnaval. Who doesn't want to go to Carnaval? Have you seen photos? But also of note Remember how I said Clea has a dead dad? The last time her dead dad was seen not dead was in Brazil. So she kind of wants to go do some investigating a year later for some reason, I don't know. So Clea and Ben ask Clea's mom if she can go to Brazil to do this job because she's 17 and has to ask her mother's permission. And her mother says no because duh. But then her mom says yes because this is a YA novel and things happen quickly. I don't have time for you to get stuck behind so I need you to keep up, okay? Boom, we're in Brazil and we're dancing. We're taking pictures of all the pretty little things that are happening in Carnaval. It's exciting, it's lovely. Ben and Claire are having a romantic moment and then they're attacked by a gang. I told you to keep up, bitch. They get saved from the gang by a mystery man. Mystery man? I guess kills the- I actually don't- does he kill them? I don't remember. Lo and behold, mystery man is the guy from the photos and also the sex dreams. Did I mention she was having sex dreams about him too? They were like vintage, like from the 1500s and shit. I don't know how she knew that, okay? But they're old and she thought they were just dreams, but this guy was in the dreams and now he's here. So he's real. He's a real guy that was really in her dreams. And now that I'm actually, now that I'm thinking about it, him showing up in all of her photos does one, not make any sense, and two, is never explained. Maybe it is explained and I missed it, but I don't think that I did, because I took notes, okay? Anyway, so Mystery Man says that his name is Sage, and Sage tells them that he can get them to safety. So he tells them to get rid of their phones. Side eye. And then he takes them to a tree house that he just happens to have in the forests of Brazil. Side eye. In the treehouse in the forest, Sage tells Ben and Clea that he used to work with Clea's dad and Clea's dad was looking for something called the elixir of life. But before Clea's dad could get any information for him so he could figure out where to go, where to go, <laughs> Uh, Clea's dad went missing. So we don't know what happened to Clea's dad. So Clea has to go to the bathroom in the treehouse and she goes instead to start snooping, as one should. And she finds a room full of paintings. And in the room full of paintings, there are paintings of her dead. It's not funny. It's, <laughs> it's not funny in a bunch of different ways. And she looks the same in the paintings that she did in the dreams that she was having. Um, she gets sick, but that doesn't stop her from not bringing it up and getting on a plane with Sage and Ben to New York. We're in New York now, baby. From here on in, the plot is pretty much just going from one city to another city while discussing plot points with other characters. So it's a lot of just this, but, um less interesting really, so you're welcome. Um, and I will point out, I might not keep this part in the video, but I have to get this off my chest. Clea's friend, the one from Paris, has a name. It doesn't matter what it is. She picks the group up from the airport. So we have Clea, Clea's friend, Ben and Sage. They go to Clea's house and Clea's mother is there. She's a senator. Did you forget? And they walk in and Clea decides to tell her mom that the reason Sage is there instead of explaining who Sage is, because it would take too long, she says that the friend that she had before and Sage are together. So her mom, for some reason, 
<sighs> her mom for some reason ends the political luncheon she's having so that all of these diplomats and her can I don't know interrogate this girl and her new boyfriend and then Clea and Ben f off to her dad's study for like two hours literally it says two hours to look for clues and that's not important I just think it's really fucking rude <laughs> to do that to you someone forcing anyone to have a conversation for two hours is so disrespectful although she did just find paintings of her mangled and dead body in his house so maybe she doesn't owe him that much respect right now but she gets over it pretty quick but anyway Ben and Clea cracked the code and now we're off to Tokyo <laughs> No one asks any questions, no one really cares. Her mom's off to go do whatever it is senators do. You know, ruin the country, take away people's rights, whatever. So Sage finally explains that 500 years ago, he was a part of the same nerd team that her dad was a part of, looking for the elixir of life. He didn't believe that it existed, but then they found it and he drank it. And then everyone died. He was the only one who took it and they got ambushed by the gang and everyone died but him, including that version of Clea. There is a version of Clea in that universe. He explains to her that he has fallen in love with her in every reincarnation that he's found. There's been four. And that just feels morally ambiguous to me because it's not like some fairy thing where he's from a different realm or a different planet. He's an earth man from earth who just doesn't physically get older, but he's older. By 500 years, he's older. And she's, and Clea is a human person on Earth who is 17 by Earth years, so... Side eye. Anyway, they say they love each other and then they have sex. Criminal offensive side eye. We're in Tokyo now. We are following the clues that Clea and Ben found leading us to someone called the Dark Lady. The Dark Lady is supposed to have all the answers they need. Clea thinks that the Dark Lady will have answers to what happened to her dad. So we're in Tokyo, we're walking around, we're looking for clues, we don't find anything, we get paparazzi which I didn't know that the children of politicians were like popping like that where you needed paparazzi but from what I understand in places like Japan people are more private. Maybe I'm making that up, but it's just confusing to me why the paparazzi is a problem in Japan, but not a problem in the United States, specifically for a politician's daughter. But that doesn't matter because now we assume the bad guys have access to the internet and they know where they are. Something that they weren't able to do at any moment before right now. But now the pressure's on. Now we're looking for the dark lady in a shopping mall in Tokyo and the heat is on. Then they find the dark lady and it turns out that the dark lady is actually Sage's ex from 500 years ago. This book is so silly. But notably she is not the same as Sage in that she's 500 years old and she looks like it. She looks dusty and decrepit. She does not look youthful and vibrant like Sage. She's withering. Okay, we met the dark lady. More exposition happens while we sit in a circle and hold hands. The dark lady tells us that Sage chose a version of Clea 500 years ago instead of her. And then he took the elixir of life. And then everyone died. <laughs> except for Sage because he took the elixir. And except for the dark lady who has a name by the way. I just don't care for it. I don't care about what it is. It doesn't matter. She's alive because of magic because f it who cares. Clea's dad was a descendant of one of the members of the nerd team that died that day. So Clea's dad, he wanted to find the elixir of life. He goes searching for it. He finds out about the dark lady. The dark lady tells him that Sage is actually responsible for every death that Clea has been through in all of her reincarnations. Basically, something Sage does something that causes Clea to die is the short way to put it. Trust me, I've sat here for so long trying to explain to you what she tries to explain to us in the most condensed way possible. It's that's it, okay? Sage causes Clea's death every time. Ben is also reincarnated a bunch of times. So it doesn't really matter. He's just like the third guy that she never chooses. But we uh, hear in this retelling from the Dark Lady, she is the one to tell Clea's dad about Sage's role in all of Clea's deaths. And so now, instead of wanting to find the elixir of life, Clea's dad 
goes to Brazil to find Sage and tells Sage that he needs to find the Dark Lady so that he can end the cycle of death. Everything's great, everything's fantastic, everyone's on board. The Dark Lady tells him that in order to die, he has to use this very special dagger and do some ritual and like yoink himself in the chest. So the Dark Lady told Clea's dad to go find Sage, but not to tell Sage that she was the one who had all the answers because she stayed alive this long, this girl stayed alive this long so that she could deliver this message. When your soul is cut from your body like this, it can't get to the afterworld. It will try to find another host, an empty body. Those aren't usually lying around at just the right moment, I'm afraid. So instead, your soul will whirl around in terribly painful suffering for a while before ripping apart into nothingness. What I'm saying is it won't be fun for you. I laughed because that is so petty, bitch. You stayed alive for 500 years, withering away so that you could tell your ex how to kill himself in the most painful way possible. An icon, I fear. <laughs> Mother. <laughs> Here's my thing. If Sage was coming to die this whole time, this whole plan was to die this whole time, why did he have to profess his love to a child? Why did he have to profess his love to a 17 year old and then have intercourse with her? Why couldn't he just have not done that and then died? We wouldn't really be here in this emotionally awkward situation, this emotionally traumatizing situation, if it wasn't for you. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? This guy's an asshole. Let him die. Honestly, I encourage it at this point. Let him die. So oh, the bad guys found us. Oops, we gotta go. So we're now in a car, in a car chase. The only exciting thing that has happened in this entire book, aside from being attacked in Brazil, we are now in a car chase. There are bullets. And then we lose the cars. And then we're at the beach. And we only have a few minutes before midnight when he has to perform the ritual. So what does Clea do? She contacts the bad guys to let them know where they are. Down at the final moment, right before Sage is about to do the thing, the bad guys show up and Ben gets caught in the middle. And they're like, we have your friends. Give us what we want. You can have what you want. And Sage is like, word. And so Sage goes with the guys and then Kalea and Ben leave. That's literally how the book ends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how the book ends, yeah. Kalea's pissed at Ben. Ben is like, I'm so sorry, because Ben's kind of a loser. And it's now, I didn't know anything about this book going into it. I found out in that moment that it was actually a trilogy. Had I known that, I wouldn't have gotten so excited about Sage kicking the bucket because I realized he would have come back. You just got my hopes up for what? For what? Nothing. For nothing. That's what. Uh, because it is a trilogy, maybe I'll read the rest of them. Or maybe I won't. There you have it. That's Elixir, written by Hilary Duff and Elise Allen. They claim that they collaborated and they worked really close to make this book. And the book even held at YA standards. It's not very good. <laughs> it's a very bad book. This book is so silly. So what was my point? Why did I bring any of this up? Why am I making a video about this? Well, to avoid all of my responsibilities, but also because I have a point. And the point is, bring back celebrity novels. I believe that we should bring back the celebrity novel. Bring it back. We give celebrities and influencers so much money all the time for way worse things. Why not make more of this? More silly, stupid books. About adults, please. I can't stress that enough. Adults, consenting adults, please. Stop taking everything so seriously. Hire a ghostwriter and write a silly little book. A silly little book. Anyway, that's all I had to say. Uh, thanks for watching, bye.